again, I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 this morning. As always, if you don't have a Bible, there's one of the few you can use. If you don't have a Bible at all to take home, let me know before you leave here today, and I will send you home with one for free. And just take it. I want you to read up with this study. And I want you to take everything I say behind this pulpit and compare it to the Word of God. I want you to prove it through the Word of God. If it doesn't match the Word of God, I want you to come and show me. Okay? That's an agreement we have here with me as pastor and you as a congregation. Your, our agreement is I will preach to you, but you have to be able to share with me and let me know if you think I'm wrong so we can talk about it. We can grow together. No, nothing has been edified from people just leaving churches because they disagree with something or somebody in the church. Can I, can I say that again? No edification has ever taken place from people just leaving a church without dealing with the issue. If there is an issue, we as Christians are called to deal with it. Matthew 18 talks all about how to deal with it. You go to somebody personally and share the issue with them. If you are absolutely convinced that the other person is in the wrong and they won't change, take witnesses. Take other people with you. Now, don't try to get them on your side. A lot of that, I, think, I think we do that a lot of times. We have an issue. It's like, well, I'm going to bring this person. I'm going to tell them the whole story from my perspective ahead of time to get them in on it. No, that's not what you do. You bring it to, hey, uh, I'm having some trouble over here. I need some help. Don't give them any information beforehand. Let them come with you. That's your witness. And then you share the issue again. If it seems that the, your witness and you agree on the issue and this person still hasn't changed, then you take them before the church. Now, this is, I don't think I've ever seen this actually practiced in the church. Then you go before the entire church and you share the issue. And if the whole church together agrees with you against this one person on the issue, and the one person will not change your mind, well, then there are steps to be taken. In fact, the Bible says, have nothing to do with that. So that's church discipline, y'all. That, that has nothing to do with our sermon today, but I thought it was important to share. So I just share it. I, I do that every now and then. I run on a rabbit trail. Sometimes it's good to be on the rabbit trail. So I chase that. Well, we finished chapter 3 a couple of weeks ago. If you don't remember, we talked about the righteousness of God in the life of a Christian today. Where to find it, what it looks like, and how we can obtain it as Christians. And if you remember right, this was an issue that the, the Pharisees of the day really dealt with because they felt that they were righteous. And I'm talking about even the Pharisees in the church, you who was a Pharisaical life, and then got saved. I mean, we're talking about people in the church got saved and were fellowshipping with all the Gentiles, and they had these mixed uh, congregations of Jew and Gentile, but yet the Jews still carried around this self righteousness with them, and they had a lot of problems with the Gentiles who just didn't do the same things that they did, the things that they thought they should do. In order to honor God. And so they carried around this righteousness. And so Paul was, was clarifying what it means to be righteous. Like I said, where it's found, what it looks like, and how we obtain it. We look at the righteousness of God manifested a couple of weeks ago. And Paul goes into detail that the righteousness of God is manifested in our faith. That's where it differed with the Jew, right? The Jew thought the righteousness of God was obtained through a strict adherence to the law. The law and the prophets, the Old Testament scriptures that taught one how to live, the do's and the don'ts of how to live. And the Pharisees said, well, we've accomplished all those, so we're righteous, but all these Gentiles, they don't follow those rules. So they're just not as righteous as we are. But Paul says, no, 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 no. Righteousness of God is found through faith. It's found through trust. It's found through believing God. To be who he says he is. And then he shows us what righteousness looks like demonstrated. And that is through Jesus Christ come to earth. God in the flesh here on this earth was the demonstration, the physical embodiment of the righteousness of God. We remember the Pharisees had a problem with Jesus, didn't they? It would make sense that this problem would echo into the bride of Christ as well as into the church. But we want to know what righteousness looks like. It looks like Jesus. We attain that kind of righteousness, and that's the last point that he puts on it. It really drove the point home how we obtain it, how it's attributed to us, by putting our faith in Jesus. He just puts them together, right? Righteousness is manifested through faith. It is demonstrated through the man Jesus Christ, God in the flesh on this earth, and it is attributed to you and I, not based on works, but solely based on our faith in Jesus. Amen? And he's 
drives that point home. And what Paul does in chapter 4, which is what we're going to start to get into this morning, we're not going to go through the whole chapter, although the whole chapter is one big lesson that Paul is teaching, is that this whole idea of righteousness by faith is not a New Testament only idea. It's not theology that became relevant or true when Jesus came to earth. And Paul is going to use chapter 4 of Romans to prove that this is the way it has always been. Righteousness by faith in God. And he's going to prove it in chapter 4. And once again, as we've done the last few weeks together, I'm not, we're not going to stand and read the whole passage. We're just going to walk through it because I like it that way. I like us all to be at the same place at the same time. Okay? So let's start in just verse 1 of Romans chapter 4. Paul starts up. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh is found? Now I want to make two points. Paul is bringing Abraham into this equation for two very, very important reasons. First reason is that Abraham was the Jews' claim to fame. Not claim to fame, claim to fame. When you ask the Jew where they became the people of God, that's what they considered themselves. And by the way, they are God's chosen people. But if you ask the common Jew, why are you one of God's people. Why are you God's person? They say, well, because Abraham is my father. And that would be an excuse that they held on to over and over. In fact, Jesus rebutted them about this fact in Luke chapter 3, verse 8. They're talking about how they were righteous because they were children of Abraham. Listen to how Jesus responds in Luke chapter 3, verse 8. He says, listen, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say, he says, don't even start with me about this. We have Abraham for our father. That's how I would say it today. I'm sure Jesus was much more mature than I am. But listen to what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees who said that they were righteous, who said that they were God's people. They were the good ones, right? All these Gentiles, all these pagans, they were the horrible trash of the earth. But they were Jews. They were God's people. Jesus says, prove it. Let that evidence of that righteousness in you show. Jesus said, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Jesus is telling them, prove it. You say you're the people of God, let it show in your life. Bear fruits that you have truly turned from sin and turned to God. Abraham is not an excuse for you. And he was a mighty excuse for several Jews. So that's the first reason Paul, I believe, goes to Abraham. The second reason is just as important that Paul brings in Abraham into the equation because Abraham, now listen to me real close here, Abraham was born, lived, and died long before the law ever came to man. Did y'all know that? The law, as in the moral law, the Ten Commandments, the sanctification laws that came through going into the temple, that all came during Moses' time. Abraham was before that. This is absolutely pivotal, uh, a point that Paul is making to these Jews that clung to Abraham as why that they were so righteous. Because Abraham represented righteousness before there was even a list of do's and don'ts to keep to make you righteous. Paul is rebutting this whole idea of a works-based righteousness that we could earn or live up to some list of rules and regulations that God has passed down that he demands we live by in order to attain to righteousness. Abraham would be an exception to the Jews' ideology and theology. And they can't resist that. There was nothing they could say to contradict this truth because there was no law. Yet Abraham was their face and example of righteousness. Verse 3. Did I read verse 2? No. Sure, I think I read verse 2. <laughs> <laughs> For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. I'm making sure I've got the right, the right place. For what does the scripture say? Now we're in verse 3. I find it interesting that Paul still. Claims to the word. 
Now you can say that the, the, the Jews and the Pharisees, they were the people who were, they had the scriptures, they taught the scriptures, so they knew the scriptures. But even yet, when Paul is proving a point of truth to them, where does he go? He doesn't have to go outside the very scriptures that they claim to believe in, but he points to the word of God. What does the scripture say? Can I tell you whatever question you have today, whatever struggle you have today, if you come to me with any question about anything at all in this world, I promise you, and several of you can testify to this, I'm going to say, what does the scripture say? Amen. Because honestly, my opinion does not make a bit of difference. My opinion, my preference, what I would like to say, absolutely has no bearing on the situation that you're struggling with or that you're facing. If you want answers, I'm going to remind you, hopefully you can automatically go to this point, well, what does the scripture say? This is where I find my answer. This is how I know how to deal this week. Paul says, what does the scripture say? He emphasizes God's word. And he goes to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. If you want the reference, and sometimes your Bible will give you that reference, and it does, you can mark that in a note. What does the scripture say? And he quotes Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God. That's faith. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. This pinnacle of their faith, this man that the Jews put so much stock in to justify their life and their own righteousness, they had to come to the truth of what the Word of God says right before. What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham found righteousness by faith. Just like you, just like me, just like every Gentile that was in the church with the rest of those Jews in that day, by faith alone. May I tell you what, that was a nail in the coffin of some really bad Jewish theology. And i got to tell you something else today. That is a nail in the coffin of a lot of modern day Christian ideology in several churches around the world even today. This idea that righteousness of God can be earned or worked for, or for that matter, lost. And so Paul is going to use Abraham through the whole of chapter 4 to tell us what that type of faith, what Abrahamic faith that brought righteousness looks like. And so we're going to go through four of these aspects of Abrahamic faith. And once again, this whole chapter we'll go through and talk about Abraham, but I'll split this up into two, and we're just going to go through the first 12 verses and look at these four different aspects of Abraham's faith. First of all, I want you to notice the attitude of Abraham's faith. The attitude that Paul is addressing. We talked a little bit about this a couple of weeks ago. We talked about the Pharisees. Their attitudes were very egotistical, very arrogant, very self-righteous. Has the church been accused of being self-righteous sometimes? It absolutely has. Sometimes for good reasons, but sometimes not for so good reasons. But listen, in verse 4. Paul gives this example. Simple truth. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor, but as what is due. Now remember, these were people that believe they earned their righteousness. They earned the ability to be God's people. And so they stood on this mentality that Paul lays out in this little bitty uh, example here. To the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor, but what is due. Paul is calling out this mentality that, hey, I am righteous because God owes me. I've earned God's favor. How arrogant, how conceited, how wrong do we become when that becomes our mentality? When we believe that for whatever reason we've earned God's favor and grace and his righteousness in our lives. That's pride. That's ego. That is something that the Bible over and over, what does the scripture say? Pride comes before the fall. Pride is evil. Pride, pride is wrong. But that's the mentality, this arrogance. If man could earn his way into grace, then grace would no longer be a gift. And then how can we take scripture like John 3.16 and really believe it, that God gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him shall 
shall not perish but have eternal life. How can we look at salvation as such a great a gift if it's something that we have to earn? Because if it can't be given, it must be owed. How many of you believe God owes you something today? Let's see, if you felt that way, you probably wouldn't raise your hand because you already know it's not good to have that thought, that mentality that God owes me. But I promise you, each of us, myself as included, we have come across situations and difficulties in our lives where we say, God, why me? As if God owed us anything better. And what is fair? Fair as hell. I work, and I'm earning a living, and I'm getting paid, that's called my wage, right? What does the Bible say? We just covered in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. How many of you have sin in your life? How many of you committed sin? Right? Two. <laughs> <laughs> Every single one of us ought to put our hand just up and as quick as that. But it's absolutely true. So, that mentality, if you have sin your life, your due, your wage, as the scripture says, and that which is true, what you truly deserve is hell. That's what you deserve. Not grace. Not heaven. So here's the mentality. The attitude of Abraham's faith is not found in that I deserve or I earn, or God owes me his righteousness. It's found in verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. It's credited. It's given. It's a gift. It's God doesn't owe me, but God has gifted me. It's the attitude of humility that says each day, and yes, even in the hard times when it seems like everything in this world is against us, and we just seem to be at the bottom of the barrel, and just seems stuck, it just keeps getting scooped and piled on, and we're under all this tremendous weight. Even after all of that, how can we come to God and say, God, you owe me a better life than this? We have to come to God and say, God, would you give me? given me a resurrection in the heavens that will never fade away, that one day all this temporary stuff is going to pass away. All of this, your, your troubles and your trials and your struggles, listen, they're real, and I don't walk over that lightly. I know that they're real. I know that some of you are hurting very much today, but you have to remember and put your life in perspective. It is temporary. It is passing away. And there is something so much better awaiting for you. Not because you deserve it, but because God loves you and he wants you to have it. The struggle is real. But if I may be so grammatically incorrect, Jesus is realer. into this Joel Osteen message of your best life now is a lie from the pit of hell. God does not want you to have your best life now because if your best life was now, what does that say about that? Amen. No, no, no. Our best life is then. Get through now. Your best life has come. The attitude of Abraham's faith is humility that God has blessed me so much. And that's what he gets, in, gets, gets into. Not just the attitude of Abraham's faith, but the attribute of Abraham's faith. The thing that describes Abraham's faith. The thing that, that really distinguishes that faith that Abraham had from anything else this world has to offer. It shows that, that to us in verse 6. Just as also David, or just as David also speaks of the blessing, underline that word, the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. 
And then he quotes Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. And once again, if you don't have that in your Bible reference, write that alongside. Once Paul is again quoting scripture, he's going back to something that the Jews would have related to and would have known. Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 and 2. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Underline every time that verse says blessed, blessing, the attribute of Abrahamic faith, the attribute of our faith today is found solely in that word blessing. You are blessed. We are blessed. We have the blessing of God over us. It doesn't matter how hard we have it today. We cannot escape the fact that we are a blessed people. Blessing is the byproduct of saving faith. Blessing is that light, that seal, that Holy Spirit that God has placed in us that reassures us that even when it's all going wrong, we can hang on to verses like Romans 8.28 and say, yes, everything is going to hell in a handbasket around us right now, but God is working it all together for good. I am blessed. And that blessing should be shown, amen? Can people look at you? Do people know that you are blessed? Now, I'm not, going, I'm not talking about going out into this world and just bragging, hey, I'm blessed, hey, I'm blessed. I got a car accident, the car tore up, but man, woo, I'm blessed. But on your every day, do people, do you have that attitude that you are blessed? Or do you walk around moping and complaining and whining and every little thing that comes your way? Do you never see the positive through the negative? Do you always have that attitude of just gloom and doom and nobody likes you, nobody cares, and everything is crap? Listen to me. You are a blessed people. We are called to live with that blessing. That's what the light is in the darkness. That's how we be the light of the world. We show the world that we are blessed. It doesn't mean everything has to go perfectly. But how can a light really affect be effective, rather, unless it's dark. You walk outside with a flashlight. Who cares if you have a flashlight? It makes no difference because it's already bright outside. When you take that same flashlight, you come in here at night. You better get spooked in here at night. It's pitch black. You turn on that flashlight. Guess what? It illuminates. It changes everything. The attribute of saving faith, of Abraham. Blessing. We are blessed people. Then Paul shows us the arrangement or the order of Abraham's faith in verse 9. Is this blessing then on the circumcised? Or on the uncircumcised also? Paul is asking a rhetorical question because they know the answer to it. For we say faith was credited to Abraham in righteousness. In other words, they say so Abraham was considered righteous right then and there. Again, circumcision had not been part of the commission. That was another one of the things that the Jews held on to so dearly as their proof. Their absolute proof. We are the circumcised people. We are the people of God. We are righteousness, and it shows. Not that they should be shown to anybody, but it shows. <laughs> so Paul throws it back at them. Okay. So if you believe circumcision is the proof that you are so righteous and godly yourself, what about Abraham, this, this man of great faith that you all believe in so much? When was he considered righteous before God? Verse 10, how then was he credited while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised. He's saying the blessing... The faith, the righteousness, the grace, all of that came long before any work or proof or sign was given to show that it had been applied. Abraham did nothing to earn his righteousness. So what blame did these Pharisees have to stand on who leaned on these outward appearances, these things that were to them were, were their righteousness? It wasn't just proof of their righteousness to them. That was how they were righteous because it had all these external signs and wonders. But Paul is saying, well, what about Abraham? He didn't 
get circumcised, and yet he was righteous, wasn't he? The work had to happen on the inside, long before it was anything that manifested on the outside. That is the order of it. And we believe that today. That's what we claim our faith is today. And that's, listen, that's something that we even, even in churches, the uh, Protestant churches, will talk about. The, where, when is baptism uh, part of salvation or is it not part of salvation? I can absolutely tell you today, it is not part of salvation. Like circumcision, the, the baptism is the outward display of faith that has already occurred inside. The righteousness is applied long before the outward signs are given. That's what Paul is trying to tell these people. It starts inside. That's the order. That's the arrangement of faith that happens inside before it ever manifests outside. But then make no mistake, it is affirmed, and Paul goes into that, the affirmation, and that will be the last point we end on today, the affirmation of Abraham's faith, starting in verse 11. And so he received the sign of circumcision. After he had faith, after his belief had been credited to him as righteousness, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them, and that and the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which we have while uncircumcised. And there's a lot of words and a lot of talk about circumcision, and I'm not going to get into other than just to say. Once again, these things that came after faith became because of faith. They were the affirmation of the faith already inside of Abraham that followed after. The outward display in, in that circumcision, what we have today as baptism, was merely a sign and a seal of the faith that we have already placed in Jesus Christ and received the righteousness of God in our lives. That's what we believe. That's what the Word of God says. To put it any other way, to try to mix any other work into that salvation equation is to do nothing less than add works to salvation. And once again, you fall criminal to that point that, well, God owes me this because I did this for him. And you step right back into pride in the error of the Pharisee, the error of the Jew in the day that caused so many issues inside the church. But once again, Paul wasn't discrediting the importance of circumcision, by the way. Because circumcision to the Jew was a great sign. It was something important to the Jew that they were God's people. Now, the faith started inside, but that circumcision was their proof, their sign that, hey, God did a work in me by faith, and I carry that with me for the rest of my life. Likewise, we as Christians today who place our faith in the Lord, Jesus Christ, and then afterwards, we are baptized. But listen to this. Unlike circumcision, which is something that carries around the rest of your life, trust me. The baptism is a once and done kind of thing. You know what kind of signs and, and, and show that we have for the world today to show that the faith was manifested in us? It's our daily life, our walk with the Lord. It's every breath that we take. It's every word that we speak. It's every situation that you find yourself in where you can still stand before the Lord in your situation and say, I am blessed. The sign of faith in the Christian today is the Holy Spirit fruit that outpours from within. If you want to know about that fruit, you can read about that fruit. You go into the Bible and look it up. I've got a verse off the top of my head about a church in Ephesians. You didn't get a perfect pastor, amen? I'm going to try to find it real quick. Step in the time. Fruit of the Spirit. Is that Galatians? Huh? It is Galatians? Chapter 5, probably? I think so. Yes, I believe that is correct. 
Yes, there it is. Galatians chapter 5. I want to read it. Do I need to Because I think it's important. But the fruit of the Spirit. No more fruit, right? If you have a tree, it produces apples every year. The apples are the fruit of the tree. Right. If you have a tree that doesn't produce apples, either A, it's not an apple tree, or B, it's a dead tree. Apply this example average church member today, okay? The fruit of the Spirit, the things that will come naturally from within the Christian is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there all is no law. Fruit of the Spirit ought to be manifesting in your life. Now listen, we all have bad days. We all have to go through seasons. I understand that. My dad would be the first to tell you, Hoover, if you talk to him, listen, even the apple tree will produce once a year, and then it goes through the winter, and it doesn't look very apple -y. Amen? I'm not saying that you won't have bad days, and you won't mess up, and these fruits will always be obvious in your life, but I am saying that if you are saved in here today, that fruit will be manifested in your life. It will manifest itself. That is the outward sign of inward faith, is the work of God manifested outside from us. And that's what faith looks like. That's what Paul is digging into these Jews who thought they had it all figured out. He said, look to Abraham, the person that you idolize so much already. If you want to know about faith, if you want to know how to get righteous, if you want to know what faith looks like, you don't have to look at all these Gentiles that you think don't have it all together. Because let me tell you something, they don't have it all together. And look at yourself, you don't have it all together. You want to look at what faith looks like. Look back at this man that you idolize so much, Abraham. And by the way, Abraham didn't have it all together. Abraham was the same man who traveled with his wife going into towns, and when he was fearing for his life, he told the king that his wife was his sister so they could protect his own life. Great husband. Great man of faith, right? Listen, as I said, we're all in that same 
We're all a mess. But I'm God is there. And he can handle my mess, amen? Amen. Can I assure you this morning that God can handle your mess? Don't run from your mess. Don't run from your mess. Don't hide your mess. You know how you deal with messes? Is surrender them. You ask for prayer for your mess. You inundate your mess with the word of God and prayer and praise. You fight the spiritual battle that is your mess through the word of God. And I'm going to ask you, are you doing that this morning? Are you fighting those battles? Are you surrendering that mess or are you wallowing? God has not called any 